I was keeping tabs on Jessica, not carefully, like I said, only you could find trouble in Port Angeles, and at first I didn't notice when you took off on your own. Then, when I realized that you weren't with her anymore, I went looking for you at the bookstore. I saw in her head. I could tell that you hadn't gone in and that you'd gone south, and I knew you would have to turn around soon. So I was just waiting for you, randomly searching through the thoughts of people on the street to see if anyone had noticed you so I would know where you were. I had no reason to be worried, but I was strangely anxious. He was lost in thought, staring past me, seeing things I couldn't imagine. I started to drive in circles, still listening. The sun was finally setting, and I was about to get out and follow you on foot, and then... He stopped, clenching his teeth together in sudden fury. He made an effort to calm himself. Then what? I whispered. He continued to stare over my head. I heard what they were thinking, he growled his upper lip curling slightly back over his teeth. I saw your face in his mind. He suddenly leaned forward, one elbow appearing on the table, his hand covering his eyes. The movement was so swift, it startled me. It was very hard. You can't imagine how hard for me to simply take you away and leave them alive. His voice muffled by his arm. I could have, I could have let you go with Jessica and Angela, but I was afraid if you left me alone, I would go looking for them, he admitted in a whisper. I sat quietly, dazed, my thoughts incoherent. My hands were folded in my lap, and I was leaning weakly against the back of the seat. He still had his face in his hand, and it was as still as if he had been carved from the, from the stone his skin resembled. Finally, he looked up, his eyes seeking mine, full of his own questions. Are you ready to go home? he asked. I'm ready to leave, I qualified overly grateful that we had the hour-long ride, ride home together. I wasn't ready to say goodbye to him. The waitress appeared as if she'd been called or watching. How are we doing? She asked Edward. We're ready for the check, thank you. His voice was quiet, rougher, still reflecting the strain of our conversation. It seemed to muddle her. She looked up, waiting. Sure, she stuttered. Here you go. She pulled a small leather folder from the front pocket of her black apron and handed it to him. There was a bill in his hand already. He slipped it into the folder and handed it right back to her. No change, he smiled. Then he stood up, and I scrambled awkwardly to my feet. She smiled invitingly at him again. You have a nice evening. He didn't look away from me as he thanked her. I suppressed a smile. He walked close beside me to the door, still carefully not careful not to touch me. I remembered what Jessica had said about her relationship with Mike, how they were almost to the first kiss stage. I sighed. Edward seemed to hear me, and he looked down curiously. I looked at the sidewalk, grateful that he didn't seem to be able to know what I was thinking. He opened the passenger door, holding it for me, as I stepped in, shutting it softly behind me. I watched him walk around the front of the car, amazed, yet again, by how grateful he wa graceful he was. I probably should have been used to it to that by now, but I wasn't. I had a feeling Edward wasn't the kind of person anyone got used to. Once inside the car, he started the engine and turned the heater on high. It had gotten very cold, and I guessed the good weather was at an end. I was warm in his jacket, though, breathing in the scent of it when I thought he couldn't see. Edward pulled out through the traffic, apparently without a glance, flipping around to head toward the freeway. Now, he said significantly, it's your turn. Chapter 9. Theory can I ask just one more, I pleaded as Edward accelerated much too quickly down the quiet street. He didn't seem to be paying any attention to the road. He sighed. One, he agreed. His lips pressed together into a cautious line. Well, you said you knew I hadn't gone into the bookstore and that I had gone south. I was just wondering how you knew that. He looked away, deliberating. I thought we were past all the evasiveness, I grumbled. He almost smiled. Fine, then. I followed your scent. He looked at the road, giving me time to compose my face. I couldn't think of an acceptable response to that, but I filed it carefully away for future study. I tried to refocus. I wasn't ready to let him be finished, now that he was finally explaining things. And then you didn't answer one of my first questions, I stalled. He looked at me with disapproval. Which one? 
How does it work, the mind reading thing? Can you read anybody's mind, anywhere? How do you do it? Can the rest of your family? I felt silly asking for clarification on make-believe. That's more than one, he pointed out. I simply intertw uh, intertwined my fingers and gazed at him, waiting. No, it's just me. And I can't hear anyone, anywhere. I have to be fairly close. The more familiar someone's voice is, the farther away I can hear them. But still, no more than a few miles. He paused thoughtfully. It's a little like being in a huge hall filled with people, everyone talking at once. It's just a hum, a buzzing of voices in the background, until I focus on one voice, and then what they're thinking is clear. Most of the time I tune it all out. It can be very distracting, and then it's easier to seem normal. He frowned as he said the word. When I'm not accidentally answering someone's thoughts rather than their words. Why do you think you can't hear me? I asked curiously. He looked at me, his eyes enigmatic. I don't know, he murmured. The only guess I have is that maybe your mind doesn't work the same way the rest of theirs do. Like your thoughts are on the AM frequency and I'm only getting FM, he grinned at me, suddenly amused. My mind doesn't work right? I'm a freak? The words bothered me more than they should, probably because his speculation hit home. I'd always suspected as much, and it embarrassed me to have it confirmed. I hear voices in my mind, and you're worried that you're the freak? He laughed. Don't worry, it's just a theory. His face tightened. Which brings us back to you. I sighed. How to begin? Aren't we past all the evasions now? He reminded me softly. I looked away from his face for the first time, trying to find words. I happened to notice the speedometer. Holy crow! I shouted. Slow down! What's wrong? He was startled, but the car didn't decelerate. You're going a hundred miles an hour! I was still shouting. I shot a panicky glance out the window, but it was too dark to see much. The road was only visible in the long patch of bluish brightness from the headlights. The forest along both sides of the road was like a black wall as hard as a wall of steel if we veered off the road at this speed. Relax, Bella, he rolled his eyes, still not slowing. Are you trying to kill us? I demanded. We're not going to crash. I tried to modulate my voice. Why are you in such a hurry? I always drive like this, he turned to smile crookedly at me. Keep your eyes on the road. I've never been in an accident, Bella. I've never even gotten a ticket, he grinned and tapped his forehead. Built-in radar detector. Very funny, I fumed. Charlie's a cop, remember? I was raised to abide by traffic laws. Besides, if you turn us into a Volvo pretzel around a tree trunk, you can probably just walk away. Probably, he agreed with a short, hard laugh. But you can't, he sighed, and I watched with relief as the needle gradually drifted toward 80. Happy? Almost. I hate driving slow, he muttered. This is slow? Enough commentary on my driving, he snapped. I'm still waiting for your latest theory. I bit my lip. He looked down at me, his honey eyes unexpectedly gentle. I won't laugh, he promised. I'm more afraid that you'll be angry with me. Is that bad? Pretty much, yeah. He waited. I was looking down at my hands so I couldn't see his expression. Go ahead. His voice was calm. I don't know how to start, I admitted. Why don't you start at the beginning? You said you didn't come up with this on your own. No. What got you started? A book? A movie? He probed. No. It was Saturday at the beach. I risked a glance up at his face. He looked puzzled. I ran into an old family friend, Jacob Black, I continued. His dad and Charlie have been friends since I was a baby. He still looked confused. His dad is one of the Quilette elders. I watched him carefully. His confused expression froze in place. We went for a walk. I edited all my scheming out of the story, and, and he was telling me some old legends, trying to scare me, I think. He told me one. I hesitated. Go on, he said. About vampires. I realized I was whispering. I couldn't look at his face now but I saw his knuckles tighten convulsively on the wheel.